Then the sheet of tin is thoroughly cleaned in readiness for use. Meanwhile, the food has been brought up in tin. These are pushed well back into the oven with the help of a long-handled peel. Roast beef and two veg is the bill of fare for today. The door is placed in front of the oven and held in place with a stay. But there's still one job left to be done. The oven will soon lose its heat if the door doesn't fit closely. To avoid this happening, the crack between the door and the oven is pudded with wet clay. The remainder of the fire is stacked against the door and the older shot gets to work. When the sergeant cook gives the word that the food is ready, the pugging around the door is broken away. The clay by this time is baked hard and breaks away easily. And here is the soldier's food, well cooked and piping hot, ready to go onto the hot plate for serving. C Company are having to rub it a bit too. They are working almost entirely with improvised cookers. This one's a very ingenious affair. The fire is built at one end and the heat travels underneath these little ovens and then around the top of the cooker again. Oil drums, clay and a few bricks are all C Company had to make it with. But it's going to do a grand job of work with these rock cakes. C Company are making sure of their hot water supply too. They've got hold of a 50 gallon drum which gives them all they need. Another 50 gallon drum is being pressed into service in quite a different way. By tomorrow it'll be ready for use as an oven. While they've been getting their improvised apparatus ready, C Company have had the use of a petrol cooker, normally reserved for active service conditions. The petrol is fed into a container under pressure at one end of the cooker and produces a flame and a heat rather like that of a glorified blow lamp. A development of the hay box method of cooking is used in conjunction with the petrol cooker. The food is brought to the boil and placed inside one of these insulated boxes. It will then continue to cook without any further heat being required. The cook writes on the box the hour at which the food will be done and all that remains is to open it at that time and serve it. Well, they've evidently sorted themselves out pretty well. Yes, sir. It's D Company I'm chiefly worried about. Well, where are they? Over here, in billets. Oh. They're using a barn as a cookhouse. There's no gas there, and altogether they seem to be having a bit of bother. Hmm. Well, we'd better go and have a look at them. Right, sir. Well believe it, how'd they get? Yes, look at the blueprints so great. Not exactly ideal, sir, is it? <laughs> no. Now, what you really need is a triplex. Have you indented for one? Yes, but we don't seem to be able to get one, sir. Mm. Well, if you give me the number of the indent, I'll see the dados. If they won't play, I'll see if the REs can't give you a 72-inch range. Thank you, sir. We could really do with some more boilers, too. Hmm. 
Well, let's see. You're entitled to one Sawyer for every 70 men. You better put in for another right away. You should never have to make tea with the one you use for vegetables and washing up. Yes, all right, I'll see to it, sir. But first, if you don't mind, I'll have a word with the sergeant cook. Right. And there's no excuse for a cookhouse being in a state like this. See that it's cleaned up at once and kept clean. And another thing, the men ought to have clean, decent hot water for washing up. That tub's a damn disgrace. You've got the facilities, and it's your own pure laziness if you don't use them. Yes, sir, but... All right, no excuses. See that it's done at once. Yes, sir. Is there no gas in that house over there? Uh, no, sir. They use electricity off the grid. Mm. Well, if you can't get anything else, I'll try and get you an electric cooker, Martin. Thank you, sir, very much. Oh, blimey, look, clean water. What's that? The cooker never bath? Not before it's time, neither. Oh, The local electricity rate turned out to be very cheap, and D Company got their electric cooker. The electricity was run over from the house opposite, which was on the grid. Next time the messing officer called in on them, he found their cookhouse looking very different. Yes, good work, Sergeant. I'm very pleased with the change. How's the electric cooker? Great, sir. Good. Right, carry on. You'll check these over in the morning, won't you? Yes, sir. Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Could I have a word with you sometime? Have it now, if you like. It's the question of waste that's worrying me, sir. Oh? Who's waste? <laughs> no, it's, it's the Sergeant Cook, sir, is complaining about the waste of food at supper time. How does that happen? Well, sir, it appears the men are staying away from supper without warning out. Last night he prepared fish cakes for 500 and only 130 turned up. And they're not warning out, eh? No, sir. Hmm. Well, supposing we make them warn in for a change. Warn in? How do you mean, sir? Every midday, the orderly sergeant finds out who's going to be in for supper. Any man that doesn't warn in doesn't get any. How's that? Well, I should think that would solve it, sir. Alternatively, we might have a high tea at five and cut out the suppers. Well, cut them out altogether, you mean, sir? Not altogether, no. There could be bread and soup and cocoa for those that want it. The high teas would have to be more substantial than they are now, but it would solve the supper problem, wouldn't it? Yes. I wonder which way would be better, sir. I think we'll start by having the men worn in. I'll have it put in orders immediately. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, there's another point I'd like to discuss with you. Yes, sir? This business of the men queuing up for meals. I'd like to get rid of that. Well, what could we do instead, sir? In the second battalion, we used to use the family system. It worked very well. There are two systems of serving food in general use in the army, and both have their good points. In the queue system, the men line up and have their food served out to them like this. The cook who serves it has a specimen portion beside him, so that he and the man who's being served can see that each portion is correct. If the food is freshly cooked and the plates are kept on the hot plate, there's not a great deal wrong with the queue system, especially if it's under cover. But if it's operated in the open with rain and wind to upset things, it can be unpleasant. And it's difficult to make allowances for personal likes and dislikes. With the family system, the men march in and sit ten at a table. The tables each seat twelve, the other two places being left for the orderlies. If any of the men are missing from their usual table, Others are moved up to take their places. Two orderlies from each table have already gone off to the cookhouse to collect the food and plates. Lids are kept on the serving dishes to ensure that the food doesn't get cold. And both plates and food are kept on the hot plate until the last moment. The importance of serving food hot cannot be overemphasized. The containers are put in front of the senior man at each table, and he serves the rest. If one man wants less than his fair share, there's a bit more for anyone else that wants it. The most important thing about the family system, though, is the fact that it enables the food to be served at the table piping hot. And in addition, it does give a more homely atmosphere to a bleak dining room. Yes, sir, I quite see that the family system would have its good points. 
But we should need a good many more serving dishes than we've got at present. Well, that's something for you to look into. If you find you've got enough, try it out. If not, badger the barrack officer to get some. Right, sir. I will. Put them down there. But whatever are they for, sir? We're going to play happy families, Sergeant. In wartime, the prevention of waste is almost as important as the prevention of disease. In the army, a small margin of waste, multiplied by hundreds of men, may easily reach alarming proportions. That is why it must be checked at all costs. I want to say something very important to you about conserving food. While this country is at war, food is just as important to our war effort as munitions. As you all know, the army receives certain rations. But these rations are intended to be a maximum. If you can eat all your rations, well and good. But don't waste them. Now, one of the ways in which you do waste food is by taking onto your plate more than you can eat, with the result that what you leave has to be thrown into the swill tubs. Now, when you go back to your mess, you'll find waiting for you a little display. Take it to heart and don't let it happen again. It's a lot, I only had five pieces. <laughs> oh, isn't it terrible to think what a lot of waste a wee bit of bread can make? Ah, Martin, how's the waste problem? Waste, sir? Oh, it's been much better since your talk, sir. Mm, we'll be for a couple of days, but it's next week and the week after that counts. That's your job. Sir? There are two ways of overcoming the waste problem. One's prevention, the other's cure. Prevention's your job. It's easy to prevent waste if you use a little imagination. Take bread, for instance. Don't let the cooks cut whole slices. They'll always do this if they can, because it saves labor. But what happens? A man takes a second or third slice, and ten to one, he wastes half of it. Cut half slices for all meals except dinner. Always stack these in the baskets provided for that purpose. Don't leave them lying about on the table. Another good plan is to put slightly less bread on the table than is likely to be used. But if you do this, always see that there's plenty in reserve in case it's needed. On dinner, cut quarter slices only. You'll find that the average man doesn't want so much bread at dinner time, and quarter slices will be sufficient then. Never leave bread lying about in the sun after it's been cut. The closer together the pieces can be stacked, the fresher and moister they'll keep. Attention to these details is important. Because once bread has been fingered or spread with jam, it's useless and must go into the swill tub. The amount of bread wasted in this way is probably greater than any other single item of waste in the army. But don't confuse bread that has been fingered and spread with clean, unused bread. This can be used up in a score of different ways and need never be wasted if your cook is up to his job. Here are some of the ways in which you can use it grating it into breadcrumbs and mixing it with treacle as a filling for treacle tarts. Breadcrumbs can also be used for coating rissoles and fish cakes. And when preparing fillets of fish for frying, dip them in the breadcrumbs too. Talking of swill tubs, how often do you have a look at them? Well, sir, not very often, I'll be bound. Well, you should. Not only to keep the men up to scratch, prevents valuable food being wasted. I remember one battalion when an enthusiastic officer used to have them turned out regularly as a matter of routine. He found whole loaves of bread, not to mention potatoes, being chucked away. I don't know whether it's ever struck you, 
that he worked out that if every cookhouse wastes a couple of loaves of bread every day, it would be equal to 20 shiploads of wheat in a year. But willful waste like that doesn't occur often, surely, sir? Well, the more often you inspect, the less likely it is to occur. If you want to talk about waste, go along and see the quartermaster. He's posed as an authority on that subject for years. Right, sir, I will. Out of breath, you big city. Indigestion. Too much veal. Tight beer. The fish cakes. Have a breakfast. Clean up their knees. Mummies. You busy? Quartermaster's always busy. Nothing but AB-54s and P-1940s all day until you get spots before your eyes looking at them. The CEO suggested I should call in on you for some advice about swill. What do you want to know? Well, what's the best thing to do with it? What it says in ACI is 185, 1154. In, in what? ACI is 185 and 1154. Well, what, what does it say? Till we, till we... Oh, uh, put it in separate tubs and sell it. Well, it's a lot of figures for a simple job, isn't it? Simple job? Who said it was a simple job? Byproducts are a gold mine if they're handled right. But handle them badly and you'll chuck money down the drain so fast that all Scotland Yard couldn't tell you where it's gone. But I can tell you. <laughs> Why the blazes, don't you? Oh, all right. I suppose I'll have to let my own job get behind while I show you how to do yours. Come on. Now, here's where the job starts. Watch him for a bit. Save that for Rissoles. Save that for Bubble and Squeak. That for the Swill Tub. Save that for Cornish Pasties. Put that back for the larder. Not so dusty. Knows his job, that chap. Too much stuff left on the plates, though. Fancy feeding good food to the pigs. Now, let's see what they do with the fat. Know the chief difference between raw fat and rendered fat? No, I can't say that I do. I'll tell you. About 30 bob a hundredweight. Mm. Now, there's your fat. Comes from all sorts of queer places, that fat. Most of it's trimmed off raw meat, as a matter of fact. First thing you do is to cut it up in small chunks and shove it through a mincer. You get more fat out of it that way than you do when it's in big lumps. Add half a pint, <laughs> water of course, not beer, and you're ready to go. The water is to clarify the fat when it's melted. Now you shove it on the stove and leave it until it's properly clarified. Then you can strain it off, ready for use or for selling. Bit of clean sacking is the best thing you can get for straining. Come on, lazy bones. Give the fellow a hand. Can't you see he can't manage it by himself? And you!